everybody. Welcome to our Encouraging Truth series. We are super glad you're joining us today. If you want to know more about our ministry, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. Uh, there you can get all the information you want to know about what we do. Uh, we started the series, um, well, actually 58 weeks ago, and we wanted to just encourage people through the whole COVID situation, but we just decided to keep running the whole series. So 58 weeks later, here we are, and we want to encourage you with something that will help you make it through the week uh, with something biblical. So hopefully that's what we'll help you with today. Today, our encouraging truth number 58 is this. There is more to this world than this world. Now that actually is encouraging and you'll kind of understand why in just a few minutes. Uh, the reason why this is kind of important to me today is because kind of when I get older, as I get older, the more I realize that the world just doesn't have that much to offer. It doesn't have much long-term things to offer. And I don't want to be a Debbie Downer today, but in reality, I think what we know is that in this world, we can have like moments of happiness, moments of like, oh, it's the greatest day ever. It's the greatest vacation ever. It's kind of like your wedding day. Like you just, you walk down that aisle and you know, it's, if you're the guy, the bride looks so beautiful. And if you're the girl, you're just like, wow, I look super hot today. Um, but then the next morning you kind of wake up and you got messy hair and bad breath. <laughs> How about the day your baby's born? It's like, oh my gosh, that, the day you'll never forget that feeling and that moment of happiness. But then about a week later, you're just like, you're, you're miserable, sleepless nights, the baby spit up all over you and you can't get him to stop crying. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, you have these moments of happiness, but nothing that lasts forever. What about the job? You've wanted this job all of your life. And you're like, I just am so excited I finally have it. But after a week, you realize your boss is pretty much a jerk and all your coworkers just talk behind your back. And what about the vacation? You want the vacation? <laughs> You've waited for it for all of your life. For us, it was, we wanted to drive to Alaska with little kids. Not a really good idea, just FYI. But we were really excited until one day we got out of the motorhome and we couldn't fight off the like 9,000 pound mosquitoes that were trying to kill us. So there's only so much that this world can offer. And what we do realize is that what it does offer, it never satisfies us. So what happens is that we just, we just keep looking for something else. We keep looking for something else to satisfy us, whether it's the next high, the next relationship, the next person. I need a new husband because the one I have isn't making me happy. I, I need a new child, okay? That usually happens when, when they become teenagers. But we're always looking for this elusive feeling, but it, but it never happens because the feelings on this earth only last just a little while. All we have to do is look back at history or look at Hollywood to realize that, that there's people that are smart enough and talented enough to become rich and famous, but they are absolutely not wise enough to make life work. We look at the marriages that were just blown up, like Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore, Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. And we see people that have so much money, they think they're untouchable. And they think, nothing's gonna ever happen to me. I'm never gonna lose all my money. I, I'm never gonna lose my status because I'm gonna do things that are gonna try to make me happy, but no one's gonna find out. We see Bill Clinton, the President of the United States, and Monica Lewinsky. He didn't think he was going to get caught, but he did. You see Lori Loughlin with this whole college admission scandal, like it never occurred to her that she was going to get caught. We see how this played out with like Tiger Woods, one of the world's greatest golfers ever to be seen, but man, his life is a disaster right now. In 2000, um, in the year 2000, he had the largest athletic endorsement uh, with, with Nike ever, ever known. And he had so much going for him. He had money, he had talent until just foolish living took over. It began with claims of an extramarital affair between him and a, a nightclub manager. Then he had multiple affairs with cocktail waitresses and porn stars and club promoters. He loses his wife over this. He checks into a sex addiction clinic. He loses all of his endorsements for Accenture and AT&T and Gatorade and General Motors. 
he's never been the same. All because he was trying to make himself happy, to find that elusive pleasure with people or sex or money. These people remind us of something. They remind us why we don't want to put our whole heart and soul into what's here on this earth. Because here's what we need to know. It never satisfies us. It never does. So Jesus wanted to tell us this, and he wanted us to look at the world with different eyes. So he tells us a story in Luke 16. He said, Luke 16, verse 19 says this, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. In other words, he's saying, here's a guy who just lived for what he had. He had a lot of money. He could go where he wanted to, do what he wanted to do. He had lavish parties. He was very, very rich. He had the latest gadgets. Like, this is what depicted this guy. Now, Jesus wasn't saying that because he doesn't think people should have money because that's, that's not true and that's not what he was saying. But Jesus is trying to show us that this man, this rich man, just lived for this world, lived for the things of this world. But then Jesus introduces us to another man, someone who loved God, but had a really, really tough life. We see it in verse 20. And at his gate, at the gate of this rich man, uh, laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. But the rich man, he just didn't care. He only, had, he only cared about himself. He didn't care about someone else and maybe someone less fortunate. But verse 22 says, the time came when the beggar died. But look at this, the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The angels carried him to basically heaven. But it also says the rich man died and was buried. But look where the rich man goes. Verse 23, in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called out to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in the fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here, you can't, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Now, he's not saying that he goes to hell because he had a lot of money. What he's trying to make a point, what Jesus is trying to make a point is, is this, that what we live for on this earth really does matter. It really does matter. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? See, that's what's so important for us to realize that, that we're putting so much stock into what the world has to offer. And Jesus is like, there's so much more to that. You need to live for me, not for the things of this world. The Bible talks about two different kinds of people. And we need to look at ourselves and say, which one am I? Because here's the first one. A wise person uh, is one who focuses their life on the things of God. Do you focus your life on the things of God? Or are you foolish? A foolish person who focuses their life on the things of this world. Now for us, when we think of foolish people, we just automatically think of the homeless guy on the street because he surely made foolish choices to get there. Or the guy in prison, he surely made you know, foolish choices to get there. Or if you're a drug addict or an alcoholic and we look at someone, we're like, well, that was just stupid. They just made foolish choices to get there. The 15-year-old girl that gets pregnant in the back seat of the car, well, that was kind of dumb and foolish. We just look at those kind of people and think they're just foolish. But you might be surprised to know that you don't have to be homeless or in prison or an alcoholic to be foolish. You can actually be, like we just saw with all of those people, successful and powerful and have lots of money, and you can still be considered a fool. John Ortberg writes about this very successful man who despised wisdom and instruction. We'll read this story together. Once upon a time in the Silicon Valley, there lived a very important man. He routinely logged in 12 to 14 hours a day, uh, a, a day work, and sometimes at weekends. He went to the Harvard School of Management where he got top honors. He qualified in his chosen field and broadened his horizons by joining the board of his professional institute. Indeed, he joined a number of boards of directors to expand his contacts. He read business books on keeping up with the sharks and took leadership courses from Genghis Khan. Even when he wasn't working, his mind would wander back to his job, which became not just his occupation, but his preoccupation. 
He found the 40-hour week work such a good idea that he'd often do it twice a week. His wife tried to slow him down to remind him he had a family. He knew that they were not as close as they had once been. He had not intended to drift away. It just seemed that she wanted time from him and that it's just something he really didn't have time to give. Instead, he gave it all to the office. He was vaguely aware that his kids were growing up and he was missing it. From time to time, his kids would complain about the books he wasn't reading to them and the games he wasn't playing with them. I'm doing it all for them, he said. Things will get better soon and our future will be assured. He knew he wasn't taking care of his body. His doctor told him that there were some very serious warning signs. High blood pressure, high cholesterol. They had to cut down on the chocolate, red meat, and cigarettes as well as start to exercise. So he stopped going to the doctor. There will be plenty of time for that, he thought, once everything settles down. One day, his chief operations officer came to see him and said, you won't believe this, but business is booming so much that we can't keep up with it. It's a miracle. But with the present technology, we just can't keep up and make a killing. So he put the company through a technological revolution, new software, new computers. The buzz phrase was 24-7 accessibility, so much so that he put his phones and video conferencing into the toilets. <laughs> But as he sat at his computer rearranging the company, there was one microscopic detail, detail that he had overlooked. An artery that had once been as supple as grass was now as dry and brittle as old cement. For more than a half a century, his, um, his heart had been pumping 70 milliliters of blood with every contraction. 14,000 pints each day, 100,000 beats in 24 hours, all this without him ever sending a memo or giving it a performance review. But now it skipped a beat, and then another, and a third. He gasped for air and clutched his chest. For a moment, he was given the gift of blinding clarity. Even though he sat on the top of hundreds of organizational charts, it turned out he wasn't in control of his own pulse. Funny thing, thousands of employees on multiple continents would obey his every word with fear and trembling. But a few ounces of recalitrant muscle brought him to his knees. His wife woke up at 3 a.m. and he was still not in bed aside, beside her. She went downstairs to drag him up to bed and saw him sitting there in front of his computer. This is ridiculous, she said to herself. It's like being married to a child. He would rather fall asleep in front of his screen than come to bed. She touched him on the shoulder to wake him up, but he did not respond and his skin was alarmingly cold. Panicking, she, ran, she rang 911 with her sinking heart. When the paramedics got there, they told her he had suffered a massive heart attack. His death was a major story in the financial community. His obituary appeared in the Times and the Telegraph. It was too bad that he was dead because he would have loved to have read what they said about him. Then came the funeral. Because of his prominence, the whole community turned out. People filed past the open casket and commented how peaceful he looked. Rigor mortis will do that. Death is nature's way of telling you to slow down. They'd ask the same foolish question that people ask when a rich man dies, how much did he leave behind? And the answer is this, he left it all. Everyone leaves it all. People got up to eulogize him. Mostly they talked about his accomplishments because everyone knew about him, but no one really knew him. He was one of the leading entrepreneurs of the day. He was an innovator in technology. He was a man of principles. He never cheated on his taxes or expense form or even on his wife. He was a pillar of the community. He knew everybody and was a great networker. They commissioned a large marble monolith in his memory. They wrote on it, visionary, innovator, leaders, entrepreneur. And at the top they wrote, success. But when it was dark and no one was around, the angel of God was sent to the cemetery. Unseen and unheard, the angel made its way past all the other tombstones until they came to the man's wonderful memorial stone. There the angel traced with his finger the single word that God had chosen to summarize the life of this wealthy, busy, respectable businessman, and it was this, fool, fool on his tombstone. God said, you fool, this very night your soul will be required from you. See, that's what we need to know. Fools can be rich or they can be poor. They can be business owners or they can be homeless. They can be wives or husbands or students or young adults. But a fool is someone who lives for the world, that just lives day to day for what the world has to offer, 
which is just a few fleeting moments of happiness here and there with no thought for living for what comes after we die. So the question is, how do you want to live this life that God has given you? Do you want to live it for what little is here on this earth or for what is so abundant in all eternity? So think this through. God creates this beautiful world, beautiful garden that he threw Adam and Eve in. It was a world where there was nothing bad, no sin, no shame, no, no anger, no bitterness, no hatred, no murder, no sickness, like this perfect place. But once Adam and Eve sinned, it took the world down a completely different path. And what they did really separated us from God, a relationship with him. And when that happened, the world changed. And now we have all those bad things, sickness and anger and bitterness and, and COVID and cancer and, and divorce and heartache and all of those kind of things. But God had a remedy. And he sent Jesus to come to this earth so that all the sin of, that we commit will go upon him because he wants to offer us something so much better. He wants to offer us a way to have a relationship with him. And not only a relationship with him, but he gave us this manual. We know it as the Bible. And the manual is for this. It tells us how to live for something so much more important than what we see all around us. Because James 4.14 says this, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while and then it's gone. What are we living for? Just what little is here on this earth? Psalm 144 says this, man is like a mere breath. His days are like a passing shadow. So if we, we know that as followers of Jesus, that we're here today and gone tomorrow, I don't know about you, but for me, I want to make a huge difference for all eternity. I want to make a difference in people's lives that will affect them for all eternity, not for what just is happening for today. If Jesus is the only way to God, then that's a really, really important message that we have to get out. I want you to imagine if you like to ask your friend like, hey, let's go to dinner and let's go to a movie and we're just going to have a really great fun time together. And you go hang out for four or five hours and, and it was fun. You had feelings of fun for, for a few minutes, but, but then it was over. But what if, during those four or five hours, you shared Jesus with your friend and she gave her life to him? You have just impacted her, not for four or five hours of fun, but you've impacted her for all of eternity. But the problem is, is that we watch TV. We watch the internet. We watch the news. We watch the, what's in the media. And everything we see says, you need to focus on the here and the now. You need to go for the gusto, go to Vegas, because what, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You only have one life, drink more, party more, look out for yourself more. But then if they do actually say something like someone died and it was sad, they'll say weird things like, oh, they went to a better place. They were such a good person. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says this, that what you do with Jesus on this earth matters for all eternity. Psalm 39.4 says this, Lord, reveal to me the end of my life and the number of my days. Let me know how short-lived I am. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, so teach us to number our days. Why? That we may gain a heart of wisdom. The first thing we need to do to make that happen is, honestly, you've got to give your life to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. He's the only way to God. He's the only way to have a relationship with God. And then what we need to do is this, seek him first. Seek him first. Not all the things that we think are going to make us happy, but seek him first. Matthew 6.33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. What will be provided for us? I don't know. Everything we need. But not things that the world gives. Because the world gives us things like fear and anxiety but you know what God gives us? God gives us things like peace. See, I have peace because I know the God of the universe lives within me. I know he's there to, to lead me and to guide me. That just gives me peace. But you know what? Ultimately, I know where I'm going to go when I die. There's peace in that. 
And you know what else? God gives us joy. Not happiness for fleeting moments in life, but joy. Joy when things are good and joy when things are bad. Because I know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who place their faith and trust in Jesus. So the question is, how do you want to live this life that God has given you? Because the choice is really yours. And I hope you make the right choice and make it Jesus alone. So here's our encouraging truth. Just know this, there is more to this world than this world. Hopefully that helps you this week. Have a really good week.